I'm making a video game. Problem is, other than being a 2D platformer, I have no idea what the game is even about. Or do I? Let's talk game design. But first... I got a comment asking for a chocolate colour as a background. Well, since we're doing backgrounds anyway, let's have a new one. Remember the last one that was all squares and rectangles? What's the one thing that's clearly better than squares and rectangles? That's right, triangles. And I know that I'm right because Ganon hasn't spent nearly 35 years trying to acquire the square force. So, boom, triangles. This background is made in literally the exact same way as the other one. I just went into paint.net and drew a bunch of triangles because I'm lazy and ended up with what I think sort of looks like a forest with some mountains in the background? Question mark? I didn't mean to make it look like that, but if I ever get interviewed on national TV about this choice, which is clearly likely to happen, then I absolutely meant for it to look like that and I'm counting on you guys to not blow my cover. So chocolate, boom, there you go, we have a chocolate level. I don't know if I like it, but that's possibly because plain chocolate isn't really my thing. So I've also made a version with nuts in as well, which is clearly much better. I am now expecting you all to fill the comments with an argument over whether nuts belong in chocolate or not. Last time, I'd redrawn half of the platforming assets to fit this amazing novel, wonderfully brilliant and original concept of contrast because I'm an artistic genius. Now I've finished that, I can actually start doing things. Alright, I say finished, but lava is still lava and honestly I might not even keep the lava because the constant flow of particles affects performance. I also didn't do anything to the water because, I mean, how do you redraw water? I don't know yet how that will work with the single colour themes I've got going on, but that's a problem for future Zane. I got this comment asking about some kind of visible indicator for where the vanishing platforms will be, which I promise I always planned to do and just hadn't done yet. It's done now. Someone asked whether the game is going to be free or cost money, and the one thing I can tell you for certain is it's probably going to cost money. I don't know how much money, but it'll probably be cheaper than the universal indie game price baseline, which is, as we all know, a large Big Mac meal at McDonald's. So what else have I been up to? A 2D platformer isn't much good if there isn't a way for you to fail horribly, and because I'm a solo indie developer, there's only one possible type of hazard I could have reasonably made. Spikes. Of course it's spikes, you knew it was going to be spikes because it's a 2D platformer with an artistic faux retro aesthetic. But like I said in a previous video, the whole point of this project is to end up with a finished game that I'm reasonably happy with, that I can then release on Steam. I'm not out here trying to reinvent the wheel with this project, although if I was, I'd just put spikes on it. When we get to the video about level design, I'll do a breakdown of the specifics of what each hazard lets me do. But for now all you need to know is some of them move and some of them don't. They all have specific functions that I want to use to force the player to do something, but if I get into that here, the video will be half an hour long. So what you should do, I think, is subscribe and turn your notifications on, so that when I do get to explaining the spike hazards, you won't miss it. See how I think about you. And the reason I don't have time to talk about the specifics of spikes is that in this video, we need to address a topic that's been driving me mad for a while. When I say, what is a game about, what I'm really asking is, what is the game's intent? A game's intent is incredibly important to design, or at least it should be, because every design choice you make should somehow and in some way be influenced by what you intend the game to do or to be. Now I appreciate that's still a lot of words, so I'm going to give you some examples instead, and hopefully you'll see what I mean. What is Sonic the Hedgehog about? On the surface, you might say it's about a blue hedgehog who fights a fat bald man and has these friends who keep popping up for stupid reasons, even though you want to put them in a blender. But that's not really telling us what the game is about, that's just the story. Depending on the genre, the story is usually a contextual wrapper around what the game actually is. Obviously this doesn't apply to visual novels, point-and-click adventure games, or some heavily story-driven stuff, but hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. Because what Sonic the Hedgehog is actually about is obviously speed. Everything in the game is designed and implemented to somehow influence your ability to gain or maintain momentum. The whole point of Sonic as a series is for you to get so good at it that you're basically speedrunning the levels. That is, in fact, the primary gameplay loop. If you'd like to hear more about the primary gameplay loop, my very first video covers the topic pretty well, so go and watch it after this one. If you're a Sonic fan, you might have heard people say, hey, actually, Sonic 1 actually isn't actually very good, actually. The reason for this is really very simple. They're idiots. All right, they're maybe not. It's actually Marble Zone. When you start Sonic 1, you go through the iconic Green Hill Zone, which is fast and colorful and honestly one of the best opening levels of a video game ever made, because it clearly demonstrates the intention of the game in its geometry, enemy placement, and bright and varied color palette. And then you get to Marble Zone. And in Marble Zone, you do this. It's slow, it's dark, it's purple, it's slow, and it's entirely antithetical to the intention that you've just been set up for. 
Little side note, antithetical to the intention is the most pretentious sentence I think I've ever said, so I'm glad you could be here to share that moment with me. It's also the reason why the Sonic bits in 3D games like Sonic Adventure 2 and Sonic Unleashed are generally judged quite well, and it's the bits that aren't Sonic when you're not engaged in what we think of as Sonic gameplay where they start to lose people. Sonic is about momentum, and when things go against that intention, not always, but often, that's when Sonic starts to feel wrong. What about Mario? Or, I guess, what's Mario about? Mario is about technique. Now, I'm not saying that you can't go fast in Mario games. In fact, if you're even reasonably average at them, some Mario games look even quicker than Sonic does, but that's not what they're about. Mario will bombard you with power-ups, mechanics, varied enemy types and platform gimmicks to introduce new challenges and variety that test your ability to platform. Whether you can do them quickly or not isn't really a priority so much as giving you a constant flow of varied challenge so that you're always being tested in your technical abilities, rather than refining what you've already learned to go quicker. In fact, the closest that Mario ever came to being speed-based rather than technical wasn't really a Mario game at all. It was New Super Luigi U, the expand-alone level pack on the Wii U that cut the time for each shorter level down to just 99 seconds, and in doing so, shifted the intent of the game while also cleverly allowing for more challenge from what is ostensibly less level per level. So we've got two types of platformer, technical and speedy. There are others, of course, Course, but for our purposes this is what we're looking at and I finally decided which one I want to do. We are going... The reason for this is that speed based platformers, or at least good ones, simply require much more thought and effort. The levels have to be much larger and you have to spend much longer testing each level to make sure your momentum triggers and enemy placement are perfectly fine tuned to encourage the kind of gameplay you're aiming for. This is not to say that making a technical platformer is easy. You still have the same considerations, but you're not constrained by having to make sure everything fits a certain feeling. Because the feeling in the player that you're aiming for, primarily, is one of accomplishment. Let's take Super Meat Boy. This is very much a technical platformer. The purpose of Meat Boy is to give you a rising challenge across each self-contained level. I know what you're going to say, but the same, if Meat Boy is a technical platformer and not a speed-based one, then why does it give you an A plus for beating the levels quickly? My counter-argument would be to answer you with another question. What does it give you if you don't beat the level quickly? Yes, you get an A plus rank for beating a target time on a level, but if you don't do that, the game doesn't throw up a B or a C or an F because the time spent beating the level isn't really as important as the fact that you beat it at all. Super Meat Boy is also incredibly challenging, and I think what I want to do is aim for a similar level of challenge. I like well-designed, difficult games that don't get frustrating, and having something I can really sink my teeth into, so it makes sense to me to make this the focus of the game I'm making. But I also don't like alienating people, so I've come up with a plan. Now, I'm not going to do the whole, ooh, all games should be for everyone, let's all hug around a campfire, why can't Demon Souls have a difficulty setting, sort of thing, but I do want as many people as possible to enjoy my game, much like they enjoyed Celeste. Celeste is a pretty good 2D platformer. It's hard, very technically tight, and a great example of the genre. It also features something called Assist Mode, which is an option you can turn on that will make you invincible, slow the game down, or let you skip whole chapters entirely. It's a feature set that aims to broaden the accessibility of what would otherwise be an incredibly punishing game. Let's steal it, but not really. What I'm envisioning is when you die on a stage, you'll get a screen that looks a bit like this. It'll offer you a selection of assists, like double jump, hovering, or an additional checkpoint that you can place yourself. Those assists will only apply for the next attempt, then if you die, you'll get to pick again for the next run, and so on. Once you complete the level, you'll be graded based on how many assists you use to beat it, as well as the number of deaths. The grading scale would work like this. A C rank would be for completing the level with 10 or more deaths while using assists. A B rank would be completing the level with less than 10 deaths and using assists. An A rank would be completing the level without using any assists. And an S rank would be completing the level without any assists and zero deaths. The important thing here is that no matter how many times you die, you can still get an A rank if you just refuse to use any of the assists. What I'm hoping to do here is encourage people to try and improve and take the intended route as it was designed, without punishing people for needing a little bit of help to get over the finish line. This is why the lowest rank that you'll ever get is a C, because a C is still a passing grade in most school systems in the world, I think. What's also important is that the assists don't show up as an option until you've died once, so the first attempt at any level has to be just the way it was designed. By doing this, rather than giving the player the option before the level starts, I'm hoping that people will play the level, do better than they maybe thought they would, and when presented with the assists think, hey, maybe I don't need that. I'm aiming for player accomplishment and that good feeling you get when you beat something tough through perseverance. You'll also notice that none of the grading has anything to do with the time that the level is beaten in. This is because, as I mentioned, this is a technical platformer rather than a speedy one. I will, of course, put in a time trial mode further down the line, as well as probably an endless mode where you just play every single level one after the other to see how quickly you can do it. But that's not my main focus right now. 
None of this is implemented yet, so consider yourself tempted to watch the next devlog and see how well it all goes. Hint, subscribe, hint, hint. Now for me to implement player assists, the player needs to die. And if they need to die, then they need a level to die on. So as a final treat at the end of this episode, I thought I'd put some effort in and design at least one level that you can look at and go, yeah, I can see myself playing that. I don't know if this actual level will make it into the game because I don't know what kind of focus I want for the level design yet, but it'll do for now. So thank you very much for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a like and do consider subscribing. And without further ado, allow me to introduce never before seen on YouTube and certainly very, very original in the field of video games, Footage of a level in an indie 2D platformer. Oh my god, please subscribe, I promise it'll get better.